Hi, uh, my name is Ali Kochman, and I am uh, your moderator today for the Metaverse panel, Is the Pen Mightier Than the Sword? Um, when not moderating uh, panels for Metaverse, I am um, by trade a mild-mannered bookseller for a great metropolitan bookstore. And uh, because that's true, there's nothing I love better than talking about books, um, bringing them to you, especially folks like you who are the most important folks, which is to say you are readers. But as much as I love talking about books, as much as I love uh, uh, working as a bookseller, uh, there is some fundamental truth to our, to our business that it doesn't matter what we do if we didn't have some fantastic authors who were writing the books that we want to read. And I have to tell you, we're lucky today to have uh, four authors with us who have written some fantastic works that we'll get to, get to talk about. So I'd like to introduce to you your pen is mightier than the sword panelists. Um, and I don't know how we're tiled, so I'm just gonna use the alphabet because it's helpful. Um, and I'm going to start with um, introducing AJ Hackwith. Uh, AJ is a, a queer writer of fantasy and science fiction who lives in Seattle, also writes science fiction romance under the name Ada Harper. She's a graduate of the Viable Paradise Writers Workshop, and her work uh, appears in Uncanny Magazine and Assorted Anthologies. Uh, and although she is very credible in her claims to not actually be an ink witch in a hoodie, nonetheless, it may be possible for the courageous to summon her using an arcane circle of fountain pens and classic role-playing games. AJ Hackwith is with us. Uh, next, we have Garth Nix. Uh, Garth is a New York Times best-selling novelist whose works include the Old Kingdom fantasy series, uh, beginning with the novel Sabriel, uh, a science, a science fiction novels including Shades Children and A Confusion of Princes, uh, a Regency romance, Newt's Emerald, it had a bit of magic in it, it's okay. Uh, and children's novels such as Rag Witch and the Seventh Tower Sequence and Frog Kisser. Um, and despite all of that, he isn't just a writer of books. He's also been a literary agent and a marketing consultant and a book editor and a book publicist and a book sales representative and a bookseller and a part-time soldier in the Australian Army Reserve. Uh, one of those things seems not like the other. We may unpack that later. Garth Nix, everyone. We also have with us Kirsten White. Uh, Kirsten White is also a New York Times bestselling author whose works have won acclaim and accolades through such groups as the Utah, Utah Book Award, the Evergreen Young Adult Book Award, the Whitney Award, uh, the American Library Association's Yelsa Teen Top 10 Books, Florida Teen Reads, the Texas Lone Star Reading List, and so on. Uh, her books include Anti Darken, Now I Rise, the Paranormalcy Trilogy, Thrillers, Mind Games, and Perfect Lies, uh, and in collaboration with Jim DiMartolo, In the Shadows. Uh, she comes to us from uh, San Diego, near San Diego, uh, a near perfect world from which for, uh, she dreams up the far different fantasy faraway worlds of her books, Kirsten White. And our fourth panelist, we have Tracy Dion. Uh, Tracy is a writer and second generation fangirl. She grew up in uh, central North Carolina, raised on a diet of Southern food and fantasy books in equal measure. Uh, after earning a master's degree in communication and performance uh, studies from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, which incidentally may make her statistically likely to be the smartest person on this panel. Um, but after that degree, she worked in live theater and video game production and K through 12 education. And uh, when not writing, uh, Tracy speaks as a speaker and uh, genre science fiction and fantasy conventions, reads fanfic, arranges puppy play dates, and keeps an eye out for ginger flavored everythings. A powerful statement nowadays when it is actually pumpkin spice we should be concerned about. Tracy Dion, thank you. So I want to thank our, our panelists for, uh, for joining us uh, on this conversation. Um, the pen is mightier than the sword. Um, 
and the old adage you know brings with us it, it contains uh, just two fundamental things the pen is um the pen speaks to us about stories and the stories we tell and the stories we retell and the sword talks to us about the trappings of those worlds the world building of our stories so with those two things in mind i would love to hear more from each of our panelists about the book that brings them here today and um uh the alphabet serves us well always so adrian why don't we start with you <laughs> sure um i have the archive of the forgotten which is coming out october 6th it is the second book in the hell's librarian series and um the series centers on the library that exists in hell of all the books never written all the stories never told all those things that writers just didn't quite get down on paper and as we know stories have a way of of, of not staying put or staying where they're told to be and um librarians have a lot more pens and swords so i definitely <laughs> am ready to to fight on that topic <laughs> thank you um garth Tell us about uh, what brings you here today. My new book is The Left-Handed Booksellers of London, um, drawing very much from my time as a bookseller long ago. Um, it is about the left and the right-handed and the even-handed booksellers who, whilst they operate two stores in London and sell books, as the tagline says, they are authorised to kill and sell books because their main job is, in fact, to police the mythic entities of the old world and prevent them from interfering and erupting into the new world. Um, the new world in this case is a slightly alternate version of 1983. Um, I made it somewhat different because I wanted a more inclusive and diverse world than the actual 1983 was. Uh, and so that's the background of it. And the story is about a young woman who a young art student, she's come to London to search for her father, who she's never known. She has a few clues from her, her mother to try and find him. And she's quickly drawn into uh, the bookseller's world, the secret world that underlies the real one. Fantastic, thank you. Um, Kirsten, tell us about your book. Yeah, so my newest series is the Camelot Rising Trilogy. Uh, the first book, The Guinevere Deception, came out last November, and the second book, Camelot Betrayal, comes out this November. It's a retelling of Camelot and the Arthurian legends um, set in a sort of anachronistic pseudo-5th century, which all Arthurian retellings are anachronistic since day one, so I'm just embracing that long, proud tradition. Um, it centers around Guinevere, who originally comes to Camelot not as a princess, but as a witch in disguise to be Arthur's sort of magical bodyguard. But of course, things are not as they seem. And when you're deceiving everyone around you, maybe the person you're deceiving the most is yourself. Um, but they're just really fun, um, very femme-centric uh, Camelot retellings. Fantastic. And Tracy, tell us about your book. Yes. Uh, so my debut novel, Legendborn, uh, has been out for a week um, as of right now, this recording. Um, and it's a contemporary fantasy uh, story about a girl who decides to infiltrate a secret society in a modern day campus. It's UNC based on my alma mater um, because she believes that the, the secret society may have something to do with her mother's mysterious death. And when it turns out that they are the descendants of the Knights of the Round Table, this is also, also an Arthurian book, uh, things get a lot more dangerous, a lot more complicated. Her mission to find out the truth and, um, you know, dig deeper into the secrets that the Order has been uh, holding tight for 1500 years uh, gets very fun. There's lots of action scenes demon hunting scenes, uh, swoony romance, um, and then lots of history sort of unearthing as the main character, Brie, uh, gets further along in her, in her goals. That's fantastic, thank you. Now, I can't help but detect uh, some thematic, uh, some themes running through some of these, uh, some of these works. So uh, let's, uh, and I'd love to hear you all talk about that, but let's, uh, Start with the the sword in the stone in the elephant in the room, as it were, uh, <laughs> about the um, uh, about the King Arthur legend, and uh, how it's um, how it's part of um, uh, two of your work. Um, but Kirsten, Tracy, I'd love to hear more about 
what is it about the Arthurian legend that was something that you wanted to retell that was important to the story that you uh, you were trying to bring to us? Uh, Tracy, tell us. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I didn't, I always say I didn't start with Arthur. Um, I mean, I'm a longtime fan of the Arthurian legends. I love the Dark is Rising sequence as a kid, um, which is like sort of 60s and 70s uh, five book sequence that draws on Arthurian legend and brings it forward into what was then the modern day. Um, and that's by Susan Cooper. So I knew that I had this sort of love and passion, but really I, I started with a story with a character who wanted to know what happened to her mother and the types of questions that I wanted to explore in my book were about legacy and about generations and about, you know, whose stories get preserved and immortalized in legends and whose don't and which ones are lost to history. And asking those questions in a fantastic way uh, led me pretty quickly to Arthur because, you know, you think about, oh, you know, the difference between a myth and a legend is that a legend typically has a real person at its core um, or there is a believed history in which that person exists in our mind collectively. And I just wanted to, to explore that. And Arthur is a wonderful vehicle to talk about those types of questions about who deserves power, who, you know, took power through sort of um, maybe um, distasteful means and, you know, what is, what is the, the right to have access to magic and what is, what is community building, why are there multiple people around this table and they all have their own ends, who can you trust? There's just so much there that uh, allowed me to work through what was that what is actually a very personal story about a girl who just wants to know what happened uh it's a mystery and she gets caught up in the arthurian legends and that helps me sort of explore what i needed to do it's fantastic kirsten now you took a uh, an approach of uh by focusing on perhaps um on guinevere who has perhaps not been um uh given her due in um, many tellings of the Arthurian story. Did you approach, um, did you approach your work with a, that sort of mission? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> show me a maligned woman in a, in a history of storytelling tradition, and I will want her. I will want to claim her and tell her story. Um, I did the same thing. I wrote a book called The Darkest Son of Elizabeth Frankenstein, where I took Elizabeth Lavenza and I made her an actual person. Um, cause that's where most of my stories that are rooted in retelling comes from is that I love this book or this storytelling tradition in this case, uh, the Knights of the Round Table and Arthurian legend, but also the things that aren't there or the way that the things are there are portrayed really bother me. Um, and so it's my way of having a conversation with something that I love and asking, you know, very similar to what Tracy was saying, why are we telling these stories and what stories aren't we telling because we're telling those ones? So for me, the least interesting part of the Arthurian legends is the sword, because what is a sword? A sword is a tool to kill people. Like, that's it. In the end, that's what a sword does. Um, and so, you know, you've got all these, the, the actual Arthurian stories are so funny because it's like, Arthur was walking through the woods and he met another knight and the knight also had a sword. So they fought and they fought for like six hours. And by the end, they were so tired. They were like, dude, you're a good fighter. I'm a good fighter. Let's be best friends. And then they went and fought some other people. And like, and I love them and they're goofy and ridiculous and fun and weird, but going, okay, what's happening on the margins? What's happening to Guinevere when she's like wed to Arthur as like an aside that, oh, by the way, he married her. And then he went and fought this dude. Like what's happening in Camelot? How is Camelot treating women? Like, um, why, what do you do with that balance between leaving behind magic and moving toward this very Christian patriarchal structure of law? And that stuff is all really interesting to me. And so I really, I was really invested in telling that story, telling like the feminine aspects of Camelot, what was going on that the dudes running around with swords maybe weren't noticing because, you know, they were running around with swords. Um, so yeah, and I'm going to plug Tracy's book. I really avoided Arthurian stuff while I was writing this series. Hers was the first Arthurian influence thing that I got to experience for years. Loved it. So good. So smart. So interesting. And, and that's one of the things I love about the Arthurian legends is you can engage with them in so many different ways and tell and find new stories every time. It's fantastic. And clearly it's um, clearly it's a source of a lot of stories ripe for the telling and retelling. But um, another theme that I detect in your describing your work is exactly about that, about uh, about books and stories and what we what we record and why it matters. And AJ, you created, you conjured an entire 
library of uh, of books that never were. Um, and that's, uh, tell us about where that came from, because that, uh, it is hard enough clearly to, uh, to write about uh, stories that, uh, that existed. And here you are uh, building a world around stories that never were. <laughs> well, as far as where it came from, I guess everyone can feel the unpublished author fears. Uh, Library of the Unwritten was my first book I wrote. And, you know, anyone knows that first novel that you're working on, you labor on for a long time, never knowing if anyone is ever going to read it or ever going to see it. Uh, and that uncertainty and that what if uh, kind of led me to, well, what happens to these stories that don't get told, that don't get made, that, you know, have virtues, have whole lives and worlds trapped within them that no one ever gets to see. Uh, and, you know, that seemed like a kind of hell to me. So I placed the library in hell. Uh, and um, the important thing about the library of the unwritten uh, in the first book is we find that, that these stories want to be told. They want to be read. They want to get out into the world. They want to go to their authors and make them write them. When, so books sometimes escape. And that's the librarian's job is to uh, keep the books in the library, whether the, the books want to stay there or not. Um, so my librarian is, you know, may, she may be able to hit pin, but she's also very stabby. So... <laughs> Uh, it's kind of important. If you've ever met many librarians, they are, they're not always a peaceful bunch. You got to watch out for them. They're, they are a, quite a, a stabby revolutionary group. So I think you are preaching to the choir. I think, uh, if anybody knows that, uh, it is, it is those of us on this panel and the folks who are, who are reading this, uh, uh, library or watching this librarians are indeed, uh, badass heroes. And, uh, <laughs> we know, and thanks for reminding everyone. Um, of course, um, uh, clearly second only to librarians in badass heroism is, uh, that noble profession of bookseller. And, uh, so Garth, tell us about how, uh, Tell us about how you came to celebrate uh, booksellers. Is it just uh, is it just as you sort of alluded to a little bit of going back into your into your history and um, giving some praise to a, 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 a vocation you had a while ago that was perhaps underappreciated at the time? <laughs> well, I'm sure there's, there's there's elements of that. It's interesting listening to everybody. Congratulations on on all your books and and Tracy in particular because the first one is always very special. They're all, they're all special. It never, it never gets old. I mean, I'm old. I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, the left-handed booksellers actually comes out today in the United States. And it's still very exciting, even after all this time. Um, but uh, it, it was interesting listening to everyone because the left-handed booksellers explicitly mentioned Susan Cooper and the dark is rising. Um, there's copies in one of the booksellers' bookshops. They're very suspicious of children's books because uh, children's fantasies often reveal secrets that they want kept. Um, so Susan Cooper was a very big influence on this book and The Dark is Rising and Alan Garner, The Weirds and Brzingerman and so on. And in fact, in many ways, the book is my attempt to take that sensibility of the children's books that I loved growing up um, and turn it into a fantasy thriller, uh, you know, for, for young adults and for, and for adults. Um, I write children's books as well, but uh, I wanted to do, to try and take that sensibility and do something in a slightly different arena. Um, I just love the idea of, of, uh, of fighting booksellers and booksellers who have magical powers. Um, I'm, I'm sure it is to a large degree wish fulfillment, um, as in many things with my books. I've also written about uh, armed librarians and uh, secrets of their library and so on, uh, which I think is an, it's an enormously appealing thing. Um, we all love books. We love bookshops. We love libraries. Um, you know, telling stories about their their greater depths and their secrets is 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 enormously appealing. I, I want to read them as as well as write them. So I'll be looking I'll be looking for, for your book, AJ. Um, I love book I love books about libraries and and books never written and and all that sort of thing. Um, it's also interesting, King Arthur. Uh, you know, the Arthurian legends and all the associated characters. Um, I've written two stories this year, which are on Tor.com, which draw on the Arthurian mythos. Um, and foolishly, years ago, in one of my collections, which included two other Arthurian stories I've written, I said that I didn't particularly like the Arthurian mythos. Um, but I'm, obviously, I'm a total hypocrite because I keep coming back to it and, and drawing upon it. And I guess that's the power of that's the power of the pen uh, of those stories, and you know the power of the pen has also preserved a sword. Excalibur is famous because of of the stories. 
Uh, so I think no, that's an interesting example of, uh, of, uh, of, of how the power of the pen has preserved the power of an ancient sword. It's certainly interesting um, because I, uh, as I think Kirsten and Tracy sort of um, uh, alluded to, you know, uh, if you uh, think about if you think about King Arthur and the Arthurian legends, and um, you're saying name the top two things that come up to you, that you think of, um, it's you know a bunch of knights fighting each other, and it's Excalibur, it's a it's a sword, and all the rest of that. But clearly, it's a very um, a uh, robust world that uh, that allows uh, other readings, other um, other interpretations, a framework that you can build other things, other things from. And I'm wondering if there are, uh, if that's the, if you're as a writer when you're creating uh, the, you're creating your stories, are you aware of, are you, how are you thinking about a character that's interact, new character that's interacting with a perhaps familiar world? I'll throw this out to anyone, but uh, since Tracy, you just came off mute, I, and you're looking very <laughs> pensive, I'm thinking that uh, you've got a thought on this one. I do, I do. Um, and so, in my in Legendborn, the the actual Knights of the Round Table were people who lived and died, you know, 1,500 years ago. And the main character in my book, Bree, is interacting with their descendants, um, who are heirs, uh, really, and. I think, you know, one of the things that I wanted to show through that was sort of distillations of some dimension of those knights. So not really the actual knight. I mean, when I say actual knight, even that is just, and Kirsten will know, this is a silliness when it comes to Arthuriana because it's all just fanfic written on top of other fanfic, written on top of other fanfic for centuries. Um, we'll call it literature, sure, but really it was just, somebody was like, but what about my character? And that's how we got Lancelot, you know? So it just, it's <laughs> really, it was, you know, so for me, it was sort of like, well, I want to distill certain characteristics of the knights and have that be uh, really challenged. I mean, in my case, my, my book is written in the modern day. It takes place in a, sort of a slightly alternate universe of the world we live in now, 2020. And um, you know, I, I, like her, I'm in, I'm in conversation with Arthuriana really as a corpus, as a whole of entire body, but also as, you know, particular types of characters and in, in the tropes in the characters that we are more familiar with and some of the more sort of commonly accepted adaptations. And I think you, I don't know, I don't know how to not be that. I don't know how to not challenge Arthuriana while I'm engaging with it, particularly because there's no part of Arthuriana that looks like me. And I think that, you know, for people who are working with stories and treating them as malleable, um, you know, and treating canon as something that we can contribute to, because I think Kirsten and I are just, we're just the most recent authors in a very long tradition. Um, you know, as she said, we're, it's our turn now, we're up to bat. And I think that, you know, it's very difficult to not sort of ask it to uh, be better, but also examine examine Arthuriana and say, actually, let's let's really dig into the parts that we don't hear about. Yeah, I think, it Go on, yes. Um, I think that the the value, um, the benefit of retellings is also the biggest challenge because you're playing in in with a known quantity. And so the value is readers are coming with a base level of knowledge. Then um, that's a challenge too, because they're coming with preloaded expectations. And so for me, the fun of retellings and of engaging with these stories and these characters that have a sort of um, cultural familiarity is that you get to build on that. You get to build on the expected, but because there are already expectations, you get to subvert them. Like, oh, you think you know who this character is? I'm going to subvert that. I'm going to build them up and I'm going to build them exactly how you think that they should be. But then I'm going to point out every way in which that's wrong or every way in which you're seeing that wrong. Um, and so that, yeah, like um, building, building on top of existing stories gives you that sort of framework to really play because your readers are already engaged um, and they might not like what you did or they might be surprised by it. But that's the goal is to take this familiar and shift it so that it becomes surprising and new again, which I think is why Garth keeps returning to Arthuriana, even though he doesn't like it. Well, <laughs> I'm just a, I'm just a, I'm just a hypocrite. 
there's, there's so much there. There's so many good things to draw on, as you say, and, and make your own and, and explore the things untold and, and make them new again. So you're absolutely right. I don't know why I wrote that stupid story note 15 years ago. It's going to, it weighs heavily around my, my neck, but uh, I'm sure I, and I, I, even in the left-handed booksellers of London, two of the main characters are called Merlin and Vivian. So, I mean, they are not, they are not related. They are named after those characters because, you know, because of a parental love of Arthuriana. But, you know, of course, there's echoes and, and, uh, and ev evocations of, of Arthuriana throughout. So I'm still doing it all the time. Well, to the extent that um, uh, to the extent that this panel can grant you absolution, look, it's okay. It's all right that you keep coming back to it. Uh, do not do not fear. Um, but I was going to say, um, like, yeah. oh, sorry, yes, I was going to say, how many books are created out of spite writing? You know, you love something about a world, but you hate something about a world, and so you decide to fix it. You know, um, and I love the comparison to fanfic because that's what retellings are, and that's why fanfic is awesome because it brings more people to the table and it opens up the story to more readers and to, to let more people see themselves in the story. Fantastic, and. Uh, so, uh, a lot of times when we talk about fanfic, we talk about it as a um, as a place to, for writers to begin to understand how to put words together and ink on paper and to construct stories. But the what you're saying, AJ, is like the very act of writing fanfic is you know a contribution to its uh, uh, in it, in and of itself uh, a rescue of something from the unwritten library, as it were. Exactly. I mean, fanfic really became fanfic when copyright became a thing. I mean, before that, it was like with the Arthurian legends, it was just more stories. And people are excited because they loved the world, they loved the characters, and that's why fanfic is so much fun. Um, I think that, yeah, fanfic isn't just a training ground for writers, or it's it's not just a training ground for readers, even. It's it's contributes to the culture of the medium that you're working with and the, and the stories that you're working with. I mean, more trans characters in Harry Potter is great with me. I mean, it doesn't matter what the original author thinks or wants or even intended for the stories in the first place because fanfic is a transformative kind of medium. Uh, and it's that kind of evolution that gets us more stories that with queer characters or characters of color or you know any number of things. And I think that that all starts um, with the ability to see stories as something that evolves and grows. That's so true. Um... And that's why I think it makes perfect sense for that you've placed your library of unwritten things in hell. Right? It is a uh, it is a tragic thing for a story to go to go untold. And if that's not a a, a book lover's uh, idea of hell, I I don't know what is. That was a a genius bit of world building on your part, if I may say. <laughs> Thank you. Well, you know, one of the jobs of the librarian and the unwritten wing is to make sure the stories don't change. They stay pristine for the author. And that's kind of a torture for a story because characters are made to change and grow. That's certainly true. Um, before we uh, before we go, I have, I have to ask this question because we touched on it a little bit with um, with uh, talk about Susan Cooper and some of the other stories that um, uh, influenced and uh, that we that you cherish, uh, but especially for um, uh, for the folks watching, uh, we got to build up some to be red piles. So. Um, can you tell us some more of the what are the stories that you cherish that you recommend that you that you want folks to uh, want folks to know about? And uh, for the those of you who are watching, uh, drop some comments in the thing. We can't read them live, but uh, we want to know what you think too. Um, stories that you cherish that you'd recommend. Um, Garth, you look like you got you. You look like you got a couple like right on the tip of your tongue. Tell me a story. Well, I've got I've got so many. I mean, Susan Cooper, of course, who, who we've mentioned. Um, there's there's many of them in the left-handed booksellers of London. Sort of servingly, I would say, buy a copy of the left-handed booksellers of London, and you'll find many. Now that's cheating. I think that's cheating. Um, it is cheating. Um, <laughs> Alan Garner's The Wizard of Brisingerman, um, Ursula Le Guin, uh, everything she ever wrote. Um, uh, Dinah Wynne Jones, again, everything that she wrote. Um, some more obscure authors like Nicholas Stewart Gray, a wonderful children's writer who's largely forgotten. Um, look, look out for um, The Stone Cage, for example, which is a retelling um, of Rapunzel, but it's told by The Witch's Cat. Um, that's a wonderful book. 
Uh, there, there are so many. There's there's so many treasures you know, from from the past and and new books too. Uh, there's, there's there's so many wonderful books in the world. So that that's just a few. Fantastic. Thank you. Who's next? Who's got a who's got the best book recommendation for the crowd? No pressure. Uh, no pressure. I'll do that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so I'm going to recommend an amazing book called Legend Born by Tracy Dion. <laughs> ah! um, I just, my favorite books are ones where you read them and you know, no one else could have written this. And in Tracy's case, in the case of Legend Born, it just, it felt so authentic and so honest and so raw in a way that I was like, this is her book. Um, I absolutely loved it. I also really, really love, um, uh, an author named Tansen Muir, her first book is called Gideon the Ninth, and it is just bonkers. Um, it's the most fun you'll have being deeply confused for hundreds of pages. And I just love that, you know, she came out of the gate with just the weirdest, wildest, most bizarre book ever. And then in book two, Harrow the Ninth, she plays with form and with plot and with structure even more. And I, that's the most exciting for, thing for me as a storyteller, um, Legendborn, Gideon the Ninth. When I read a book and I think, I could never in a million years have written this. It's so relaxing for me to read because there's no pressure on me because I couldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. AJ, what do you think? Um, well, if you're going with classics, you know, I think I was really influenced by Neil Gaiman, um, Shana McGuire, uh, all fantastic writers. Um, but the new stuff is what I'm really excited about because as Garth said, you know, people, writers love books so we love writing about books and books about books um some of the favorite ones i've read recently has been the unlikely escape of your eye keep um by hg perry really great it really plays with the idea of the reader as a power too and how you how you interpret a book and how you um how your your take on a book changes the character uh and when characters wake up and come out of a book they're you know, depend on that interpretation, which is really neat to see, because you often see from the writer's side of it, but you know, rarely see uh, magical, you know, books about books from the reader's side of it. Uh, I really loved that one. Um, the Imaginary Corpse by Tyler Hayes. Uh, if you love, like, imaginary worlds and you miss your imaginary friend when you were, when you were a kid and you wonder what happened to him, it's, it's like, a, it's like, it's, it's like, um, it, it's, it's like imaginary friend noir. It's very, it's, there's a murder mystery and it's, it's fantastic. Oh gosh, there's so many good books. Um, the Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern that came out recently is amazing. Uh, anything by Shannon McGuire, I love her books a lot. Middle Game was fantastic if you love playing with the idea of the power of thought and words and numbers and the mix between those things. So yeah, just read. Fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. Tracy, what are some of the stories you cherish? Um, so I, I've been sitting here thinking and swirling in the themes of this panel. I really realized how much I wanted to reread The NeverEnding Story. Um, the, the original novel, um, uh, I'm going to mis mis mispronounce his, Michael's last name, but it's um, in the it's German, um, but the original Neverending Story is so much more than the first movie, even the second movie. It's just this fascinating journey of, uh, of, you know, what we all want to be able to dive into our, into a book, but then of course diving into the book that Bastian reads has all these uh, unintended consequences. It, it addresses sort of like colonialism and, you know, it addresses, um, you know, um, what does it mean to rule and what does it mean to have power? What is leadership and all of that stuff. Um, so I, I really think that that's one that people sort of quote unquote sleep on the actual book, not just the movie, although the movie is epic also. Um, and I really also like, uh, I went back to The Hero and the Crown recently by Robin McKinley in The Blue Sword, um, books that I read, you know, out of order, actually. Um, I read The Hero and the Crown first, which is set back in time, and then The Blue Sword is the sort of sequel, but they were released in reversed order. And I, I only read them that way now. Um, but the, you know, those are those are books that to me. I mean, Robin McKinley, I think, just sort of like was my first introduction to a certain type of feminist fantasy. 
um, and in the power of women across generations is a big sort of theme and what does that mean and what gets lost when you lose connections to your mothers and stuff like that so that's just on brand for me right now as well um, and then uh, uprooted by Naomi Novik is just a perennial favorite um, if you haven't read any of Naomi Novik's work she's extremely rich around language and this book is just I go back to it every few months and just read like a paragraph or two just to get back into that world that she's created that's so rich. That's fantastic. Can I just say too, um, it's a little bit breaking my brain to just casually be on a panel with Garth Nix. Because <laughs> when my teenagers were toddlers, I used to push them in my double stroller to the library. And while they were playing in the little play section, I just pull his books off the shelves and sit on the floor reading Garth Nick's Incredible Worlds. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, that's one of the weirdest well, things about being an author. Yeah. <laughs> it's when you're like, oh, hey, hey, just hanging out with, you know, the guy that I used to read his books and think, oh, man. I don't well, know. I don't know if I'll get there. So. It's a big family tree. It's one of the great things. We're all part of this massive family tree that goes back. And, and Robin McKinley's a massive influence on me. I love those books. I, I reread them. So it's it's one of the wonderful things about being an, an author. Is you know we we love books. Our influences you know extend back, and and we we share them. And uh, but it, it's it's nice to hear that uh, the books distracted you. <laughs> From you know, they serve a useful purpose as well as being, I hope, fun to read. <laughs> Absolutely, that's fantastic. Um, and I, uh, I think we're coming down to um, uh, coming down to our time. So I'd like to, um, uh, I'd like to wrap up a little bit. So if our question was, you know, is the pen mightier than the sword uh, about the stories of the worlds of ours? I don't know that we've, uh, I don't know we've came up with an answer for that, but I think we've come up with the answer. It doesn't matter because what matters is stories. And I think uh, towards the end there, we actually came on, uh, came up with a, brilliant insight that was forgotten, that uh, stories are important, retelling stories are important. The most important part is the readers of those stories. So I absolutely want to thank uh, AJ and Kristen and Garth and Tracy for being with us at this panel. I want to thank the gang at, uh, at New York Comic Con and Metaverse for making this possible that we could, uh, we could do this this way. Um, and we will meet again in real life person uh, coming up soon promise but uh, this was fun regardless right um, but most of all most of all I want to thank everyone who's watching this I want to thank the folks who are readers who make this all uh, possible and make this all worthwhile um, you are the most important part of this equation so thank you again to our panelists AJ Kirsten Garth Tracy and thank you to our readers um, Stay safe, stay warm, stay dry, and whatever you do, please, whatever you do, read a book. Thanks very much. Thanks all. <laughs> Bye.